Well, this presentation will involve cattle thermal regulation. Overall, we'll talk about how cattle can use biophysical means to regulate their body temperatures and how mankind, the managers, can help them. And it's all under the concept that there is some climate change going on out in the entire world and a lot of these changes involve increased ambient temperatures so maybe a lot of my comments will be about heat stress in animals or alleviating heat stress but maybe not only so the first basic material I would like to present are the various heat transfer mechanisms that occur out in the real world not only for cattle but anything inanimate or animate these are basically physical principles physics I guess you could say I know some places call these biophysical mechanisms that's a big broad category <coughs> and it's basically involved involving biophysics which is an interesting topic so if you're a student out there man if you could take some courses in biophysics I would highly suggest that here's one definition of biophysics a branch of science concerned with the application of physical principles and methods to biological problems okay so that's biophysics that's the definition and in our case for when we're going to talk about cattle we need to talk about the five heat transfer mechanisms <clears throat> and on one level it's all physics so here we go the first thing that I want to divide and I guess I should get my laser pointer going here is that the heat transfer mechanisms can be divided into sensible mechanisms and insensible mechanisms this is a little hard to understand but basically it is when sensible heat transfer mechanisms happen there's a temperature change that can be measured at that very moment of the heat transfer <coughs> insensible heat transfer mechanisms involve a transfer of thermal energy that involves some what's called a phase transition a phase change we're going to refer I'll restrict that to water phase changes of water but at the moment that the thermal energy is consumed for the phase change there is no temperature change between let's say the solid no I should say the liquid water and the water vapor uh, don't dwell on that too much because some people can get lost <clears throat> so let's do the sensible heat transfer mechanisms and I'm having a little trouble here but here we go and the sensible involve three methods three mechanisms I perhaps should say <clears throat> And notice all these, I said thermal. I in, preface these with all thermal. So thermal conduction. And you could look up the factors that affect conduction, but basically it's heat transfer through solid objects. Nothing is moving. Okay, so it could be like your cup of coffee in your hand. The heat is going to move through the cup wall but it's going to be dependent on the uh, temperatures heat always flows from high to low and in conduction we know that an object or an animal can gain heat that's what this plus is for can gain heat by convection uh, conduction conduction or it can lose heat by conduction so let's say an animal is laying on a hot floor we have a heating pad and it's laying on it so it's in sternal recumbency there's a lot of surface area touching the heating pad well we know the animal is going to gain heat by conduction 
If instead it's a cooling pad, like maybe they might use in some for some sows, well then if the cooling pad is cooler than the surface of the body, the sow's body, then the sow will lose heat by conduction. Okay? Then we have thermal convection. And whenever you see the word convection, that means something is moving. Air is moving, water is moving, blood is moving, and the animal can gain heat by convection or it can lose heat by convection. Just a little sidebar, there's two types of convection, natural convection and forced convection. Natural convection is where, let's say, hot air rises. Forced convection always involves some kind of pump or motor, like a fan. Okay, and then we have thermal radiation. And here's where I really like to put thermal in front of radiation, because if we talk about radiation by itself, most people will think of uh, some nuclear power plant that got blown up and it's got you know radiation contamination for so many miles so basically thermal radiation is the transfer of heat by electromagnetic waves and the best example is the sun warming you up or a cow on a sunny day I don't know I'm not sure how many miles away the sun is but it's many many miles and that heat is transferred by electromagnetic waves and when it hits some object, if the object is cooler than the waves that are coming in, it's going to gain heat. So you can gain heat by electro, uh, thermal radiation, but you can also lose heat. So if I'm standing by a cold barn wall, or a cow is, then the integument of the animal is going to be sending electromagnetic waves to the cold barn wall and the animal will be losing heat. That's a little harder for us to sense but uh, it does happen. Maybe for cattle the biggest thing is the thermal radiation they gain from the sun and sometimes that's desirable on a cold day but that's not desirable when it's really warm out. You don't want that and we'll be talking about how you can alleviate thermal radiation. Well then, the other mechanisms are insensible and there's two of them and it ends up being these two, like I said before, involve a phase transition that transfers the heat. So let's do evaporation first and we'll do for animals. Animals sweat, well then that's water and you should note, little sidebar, Sweat involves loss of water and electrolytes. But when water evaporates, that's a phase change from liquid water to water vapor. And when that happens on the integument of an animal, it can only remove heat from that animal. So notice there's a minus here. You, The surface, doesn't matter if it's an animal or something inanimate, when that phase change called evaporation for water now we'll say happens there's thermal energy removed from that surface so there's a net cooling effect so I will have to say now the four mechanisms I've talked about up to this point are the most important for animals evaporation is the most the, let's say is a very important factor when ambient temperatures are high and then because maybe a little sidebar maybe I'll show you one of these graphs later you know there's the thing called the temperature humidity index THI and then on the other end of the spectrum of ambient temperatures when ambient temperatures are low convection is a very important factor and we call that wind chill and yes, wind chill affects us. You hear the weathermen talking about it. But wind chill also affects cattle, dogs. It affects anything that has heat to lose. So you know the skin of a cow or us, like ours are usually 80 degrees. For outside, we've got the direction will be 80 degrees to whatever the cool 
areas. And um, so that's an important factor. And there's a thing called a wind chill chart. Maybe at the end I'll show you those charts so you know that if, you, if you're not familiar with those, that you can see them. So now I want to take a few minutes to look at these two different subspecies of cattle. The boss, Taurus, which have been selected more for the cooler climates, let's put it that way, and then the boss, Indicus, the cattle that are have been selected over time to tolerate more of the hotter environments. Okay, now I've got a website going to show here. Um, I can't really enlarge it well, but I'm going to read this and then you can maybe enlarge it. This is a list of Boss Taurus cattle, sometimes sometimes called Taurine, Tauron cattle. And you can see up here, Boss Taurus are the typical cattle of Europe, Northeastern Asia, and parts of Africa. And down here it says, um, that same thing, they are referred to as the taurine cattle, and many are adopted, or I should say, sorry, adapted to cooler climates. Adapted is a good term here because that means over generations, they basically have been selected for more of the colder climates. Now I'm just going to scan up here because I didn't realize there's this many breeds, and you could stop it or pause it or whatever if you want to look for a certain breed. But these are alphabetical, and these are the list of Boss Taurus cattle at the website that's up on top. So you can always just right go to that website and see this list. I just show it to you so I guess you can appreciate how many different breeds of cattle there are in this Boss Taurus subspecies of cattle. There it goes. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a list of cattle breeds for the Boss Indicus. And you can see that up on top. You could go to that website that's listed way up on top. Um, and see, I'm sure it still exists, but who knows how long after I make this. But these cattle are also known as the humped cattle, Brahma cattle, and they're originating, they were originated in South Asia. And I'm just reading this up here before I scan all these names. And let's say, characterized by fatty hump on their shoulders, that's a big characterization, drooping ears, and you can see that in this picture here, and I maybe will show that in a better picture. And then a large dewlap. That's kind of like in the brisket area, this large amount of skin. And basically, one of the things that, that those three characteristics do, it increases the surface area exposed to the surroundings. And, and then I'm just reading here, they are well adapted. Adapted is good because over generations to withstanding high temperatures and are farmed out, you know, through tropical countries. And they can be pure zebu or they can be hybrids with the Boss Taurus cattle. Um, anyway, so here's the list. Let me go th slow. This might be kind of small for you, but you can go to the website or you can enlarge the screen. I'm just going to list those, and it's not as long as the Boss Taurus. So there's the whole list right there. Okay, let me show you a picture of a typical Boss Taurus bull in this case. And <clears throat> you can see, in contrast to the Indicus, the Boss Indicus animal that I'll show you, there is no prominent hump over the shoulders. There are no drooping ears. The ears are at least half or less than what you'd find in the indicus. And then the dewlap area is here. 
and there's not a lot of extra tissue showing. So let me move this one out of the way, but keep it kind of in the picture and show you a boss indicus. And actually, it happens to be a bull too. So I didn't, I didn't plan to have just one sex, but that's okay. So then, obviously, a large hump over the shoulder. Look at those ears. That's at least two or three times longer than the animal up here. And then this dewlap. You can see the amount of surface area that that provides. Uh, and to me, and I'm not sure if there's any studies about this. I'm, there probably are. To me, the integument looks thinner. Now, that's hard to see on the surface, but, you know, this Hereford up here has pretty thick hide, and I think that makes them a little, also a little more adapted, adapted to cold weather versus these guys. There's less thickness of the integument. That means blood vessels could be closer to the surface, and that means the heat transfers through less skin, and that would make it would help the transfer. Since I don't know the background of the viewers looking at this video, I'm going to do one more um, item here for basics. And I'm enlarging this figure here. And I'll show you where I got this figure. I'll cite it at the, the end of the presentation. But what I want to show you is how body temperature, and that's over here on the y-axis, uh, changes under changing environmental temperatures. And that's down here, and I think you can see my laser pointer. You might also call this ambient temperatures. OK. Now, notice there are no figures here, because although this probably refers to <coughs> cattle more than anything from the article I got it from, it's all very basic. And I'll define some of these things quickly, and you could look it up someplace else. But LCT is what's called a lower critical temperature. That's the lowest temperature of the ambient temperature where an animal is still comfortable. Because this zone here, that's between lower critical temperature and upper critical temperature, is called the thermal neutral zone. <clears throat> and although this figure doesn't show it, basal metabolic rate is the lowest or is established in this zone. The animal doesn't have to provide any additional heat to the body to keep the body temperature constant. So really over here, if we followed this over, we could put normal body temperature at this point on the y-axis. And you know that fluctuates somewhat. But the thermal neutral zone is the case where the body temperature is constant and basal metabolic rate is all that's needed to keep the body temperature. Now the thing beyond when we go to lower temperatures for the lower critical temperature, below lower critical temperature. We start, I guess you could say, cold stress. But look at, for a while, the cold stress doesn't result in a lower body temperature. So you've got this zone here where body temperature is being able to be maintained. And likewise, when we have heat stress beyond the UCT, there is still an area where body temperature is maintained constant. So look at this, constant body temperature from this point to this point, and that's why they call it the homeothermia, homeothermia, thermia zone, homeothermia. And down here, we could put absolute upper critical temperature, and over here we could put absolute lower critical temperature. Uh, the body had to make more heat in this zone, but it's making more heat and it's maintaining the body temperature. Over here it's conducting mechanisms that are trying to get rid of heat, and it does get rid of heat, but it's still going to generate some heat, but the heat it um, loses is more than the heat that's gained in the mechanisms. That's a little tough to understand. Anyway, when we get 
beyond the absolute lower critical temperature, then we start a case where hypothermia can occur. And hypothermia is lower body temperature than normal. So here's normal, this is lower. But the animal is still alive. And when we get above up, absolute upper critical temperature, we have hyperthermia. But the animal is still alive, although body temperature is going up. It'd be like a dog found in a car and its body temperature is 103.5, not the normal, like 101.5. So you can live in that zone <coughs> up to a certain point. So you could actually write death over here for this hyperthermia, and over here for hypothermia, you could put death here beyond that. And But in that zone, it's called the survival limits of the animal, and maybe we're talking about cattle, so of cattle. This applies to basically all mammals. It's going to work like this. There'll be a range where body temperature is maintained, and then we fail and lose body temperature, lowering it, and there's a zone where we end up elevating body temperature. And so maybe over here you could say extreme heat stress over here and extreme cold stress over here. So it's a nice little figure. Um, at the end I'll tell you where I got that from. Okay, here's another figure I want to explain. It's going to be referenced at the end of the presentation. It's uh, from the same publication as the just the previous figure was. And I'm going to like summarize this beyond what, what they have here. But they mention solar radiation. I guess I would say thermal regulation. And there are all those, those different types, short wave, long wave. The point is you can get it directly from the sun. They call number two a diffuse. It might diffuse through the atmosphere and get spread out more, but that's still thermal radiation reflected off a cloud. That's number three. Number four over here, it could be bouncing off the ground, and they're calling that reflected from the soil surface. <clears throat> and we know if for some reason that soil surface was dark, less would reflect. If it was white, which uh, may be like snow, then more would reflect to the animal. Okay, so that's through four. Number five back here refers to radiation coming not from the sun, but from basically the solar system. Remember, you don't have to have the sun for radiation. Then number seven here, I'm skipping numbers because seven is showing you... Uh, Remember, radiation, thermal radiation, an animal can gain heat that way or it can lose heat. Now, in this case, this animal's integument, if it's a sun, summer sunny day, that integument's going to be warmer than the rock, I think. So the heat is going to flow. Electromagnetic waves are going to heat up the rock from the animal's body. Or if the rock is hotter for some reason, then we're going to admit that way. I like how this shows the two-way path for solar or for thermal regulation or thor sorry thermal radiation whereas these other mechanisms are always going to be warmer so they're always going to come into the animal but not probably uh, go away from the animal so it's going to be that's a next the net plus and then number six here is talking about conduction and conduction is the case where you have some solid objects touching each other. So they're probably referring to the hoof on the ground, and the ground is probably cooler than the cow or the Brahma bull in this case. So heat is going to flow that way. But I like how they have showing it can be two ways. I guess that's important. Uh, then number eight here is again we have uh, heat exchange I guess I did that by long wave radiation and it can go back to the it's a double headed arrow here and indicate flow of the electromagnetic waves could be both ways then number nine heat loss by cutaneous evaporation remember if it's evaporating that's only a one-way mechanism so you're losing heat 
And of course, cattle do have sweat glands, and I'm going to mention that a little bit later. The um, Brahma tend to have more sweat glands. And then number 10 is convection. And of course, you know that has to be flowing air. And in this case, if that warm body is heating up air, air is going to be um, getting lighter. Hotter air is lighter, so it's going to be natural convection away from the animal. Okay, and I think that's uh, number 11. Where's number 11? Okay, we did number 11. Heat loss. Oh, wait a minute. No, we didn't. Heat loss by pulmonary evaporation. So number 11 is we're evaporating. And so remember, evaporation from the lungs is basically a loss of water, but not a loss of electrolytes. And then when we talk about evaporation, we're talking about the loss of water and the loss of electrolytes. Then let's look at the effects of heat stress over here since it is mentioned. Now what you should always know is the animal can have behavioral changes, responses they say, and physiological ones. So let's go through this. Usually when there's a heat stress situation, and that's what I'm talking about here, right? Heat stress. There's an increased water consumption, then reduced dry matter intake, and that's related to the postprandial thermogenesis or heat increment. You know, when you eat, you generate more heat because of the increased digestive tract contractions and so forth. Uh, then you get decreased activity because when you move around, the muscles make heat. So why do you want to move around when you're heat stressed? And then, of course, if they have free range, free mobility, they can look for shade, and many of the animals do. I don't know if you've ever driven by a pasture on a hot summer, summer day, but if there's one tree that's got a lot of shade, all the cattle are under the shade. Now, physiological responses <coughs> are something that you usually can't see, but sometimes you can. Let's see this. Increased rectal temperature. Well, you can measure it, but you can't see it. Uh, you could actually measure increased respiratory rate, and you could, you know, count that as you're looking at the animal. Increased sweating, you could document that by experiments, but uh, you should know that cattle sweat. Uh, there's a decrease in production. That might be measured by decreased milk production, decreased gain per pound of feed consumed. Then there is an increased peripheral blood flow and reduced organ flow. So you're going to shunt blood away from the internal organs and send it more out to the cutaneous region where it's going to be able to exchange more heat or lose more heat to the environment, I should say. Then, usually in hot climates, cattle have a decreased reproductive performance. I know in some of the Boss Taurus cattle, if it's in August and they're in a hot environment, sometimes they're not even bred, especially for AI, because the management knows that there'll be very low cons uh, conception rate. And then the heat stress can cause decreased immunity, and if you decrease the immunity, you increase your susceptibility to any diseases. And that's the summary of that figure, which I'll reference at the end here. Okay, so now I just want to hone in on some other items. Sometimes it's a little <clears throat> summary of what we've had before, but others it's new. So a lot of people that deal with cattle know that air temperature, or you might say ambient temperature, is very important for cattle. Most of the cattle in the world are housed out of doors most of the time. But then also relative humidity is important because you know that if you get above the upper critical temperature and humidity is very high, that decreases evaporation. So you decrease your heat loss right when you want to have heat loss. Then wind speed, or you could say wind velocity, is not very important on the hot end of the scale, but on the lower ambient temperatures, this becomes like the secondary factor or the second most important factor after temperature and this is where wind chill comes in. Anytime an animal or object has temperature, that it has a higher temperature than the ambient, then wind speed is going to take 
heat transfer heat away and then here it says solar radiation and the reason it doesn't say thermal radiation is when you're talking about cattle outside solar radiation is the big factor of all the radiation that can occur and so that's why you have cattle seeking um, <clears throat> shade as it was mentioned just previously then I'm going to talk about what happens or what are the responses sometimes when animals get above high upper critical temperature and get below the lower critical temperature so let me make some statements about when an ambient temperatures get higher than upper critical temperature and I'm just referring to some past articles that I was reading <clears throat> so if you get past or higher than the upper critical temperature here we are, then the animal will seek shade, we've already said that, increase water intake, decrease feed intake, and then one thing I haven't mentioned, it might seek colder surfaces. If there's a cooling pad or a river or a stream, it might actually, I've seen herds of cattle standing knee deep or even deeper than that in a river or a pond on a very hot day. Then, so I'm referring only to cattle here now, then lower than, when the ambient temperature gets lower than the lower critical temperature, we know that there's an increase in feed intake. That's a um, behavioral change. Animals can also avoid cold surfaces. They may be going to lay on straw rather than the bare ground. They're going to seek solar radiation just the opposite of what they do when they're hot. When they're cold, they can seek solar radiation. And then another thing that animals do, they tend to huddle into small groups when they're cold stressed, because then when you huddle and your integument touches another animal's integument, you decrease the effective surface area exposed to the ambient conditions. Let me make a few more comments. Um, I want to contrast cutaneous evaporation. That would be evaporation from the entire integument, the entire skin, versus the evaporation from the respiratory tree. Now, we know that when cattle are heat stressed, they do breathe more rapidly. Their respiration rates would go up. Okay, and it seems like the boss Taurus cattle have a greater increase in respiration rate than the Zebu cattle, the Brahmas. Quite a bit difference in some studies. So here, cutaneous evaporation basically accounts for about 85% of the latent heat loss. And so this might be a term I hadn't mentioned before, but when you have evaporation, that's the insensible, remember, and insensible heat loss and latent heat loss mean the same thing. So about 85% of the heat loss for the cow at any given moment or period of time is from the skin, and then about 15% of the heat loss would be from the respiratory tree. And I guess you can see that if you look at the surface area, there's a lot of cutaneous surface area because the respiratory tree, we're not talking about all the alveoli, we're just talking about the main airways that are evaporating moisture. So I wanted to get that point across and get this out of the way. And then finally, we know that black-haired animals would absorb more thermal radiation or more electromagnetic waves than a white-haired animal. And that's been very clear. If you have a black-haired animal out in solar radiation, their skin temperature is going to be higher than a white-haired animal. And so that can mean, make a difference. Although if, although if it's hot and they're both heat stress, you know, both animals are going to seek the shade, but maybe the black-haired animal will seek the shade faster.
So now I want to just mention some management techniques. We have referred to some of them, but let me make a little list, a verbal list here, and I'll talk slow. But you know, for cattle, one thing that will help a lot with solar radiation is providing shade. So that's one thing about the management techniques. Provide shade. You can provide mobile shade. So if you happen to rotate pastures, then you can move the shade, put them on some kind of skid mechanism. Another suggestion for when you manage cattle is try to have the water source close to the, the shade and that way they don't have to ver walk very far to get to the water. In fact, you know, if it's possible to have the water under the shade, then that the water device, the water faucet, whatever device you're using, that would be better. Another management technique would be fans. Of course, this isn't very practical for cattle that are out on pasture, but for like dairy cattle that are sometimes in these um, open sheds where there's a roof, but there's not maybe sidewalls, then you could have some ventilation with some fogging devices. That would be another thing. Uh, also, another management technique involves what you feed. It ends up being high fiber diets tend to increase the heat production by animals. So if they're eating a lot of roughage, they're going to make more heat than if they had a less roughage diet. And that's one thing. And it's also been shown that when you add lipids to the diet, that he helps to reduce the heat production due to the diet, although there's limits on that as well. Uh, a few other studies have shown that chromium, chromium supplementation, chromium, my tongue is getting tied, helps with uh, reducing heat stress in some cases. And one last thing that I can put under management techniques here is genetic selection. Gen selection by man of cattle that are more tolerant to heat stress than others. And they've actually done, shown this like in Brahma cattle versus Angus, I believe. The body temperature was actually lower by about 1.5 degrees C in the Brahma cattle as exposed as opposed to the Angus cattle. So that's quite a difference when the two cattle are in the same environment. And then of course, besides selection within each of the subspecies, you can crossbreed Bos Taurus cattle with Zebu cattle and come out with a more resistant, heat stress resistant animal than when you started, especially if you look at the Boss Taurus uh, parent. Thanks a lot. Oh, that's right. I'm going to do, uh, my next slide is going to be the couple of articles that I've got from. So I do want to give a shout out to some of the references I used. Uh, here's one. It was an article. It's a review article, so that's very good. It's mostly about heat stress, and it contrasts Boss Taurus and Boss Indicus cattle very well. It's kind of a long article, but um, I summarize part of it here. So that's a good place to start for those of you that are interested. Here's a book, a textbook that would be for all environmental physiology of animals. And uh, if you're interested only in domestic animals, this one maybe is not the best for you because it's got all animals, especially aquatic animals, marine animal, animals, birds, and so it gives a broad uh, view of environmental physiology for the animal kingdom. Here's one, um, environmental physiology of livestock. It also has some good information, but you really need some basic thermodynamics or thermal regulation before you understand most of the chapters, but it's still very good. And that's my uh, kudos to those references. Thank you.